lecture is going to deal with the Greeks, which are a very important part of Western civilization. In fact, if you uh, consider the contribution of, of the Greek thinkers and how the philosophies of the Greeks influenced Western civilization, we owe them quite a bit. Um, your book deals with the, the rising of the Greeks and uh, kind of the precursors to Greek civilization with the Etruscans and then moves into dealing with Greek society, culture, uh, philosophy, and literature. Um, so really uh, one of the best places to begin when talking about the, the literature of the Greeks is to look at the works of Homer. Homer is a fascinating uh, poet. Um, anyway, the, whether or not Homer himself was a, uh, the man who put the pen to the paper, there were traditions, oral traditions, uh, that were pulled together and titled and given credit you know, he was given credit as writing them, but um, in all probability, the Iliad and the Odyssey drifted into being rather than, you know, someone sat down and wrote them. Uh, so, you know, gradually and indefinitely, like a popular myth, the, the Iliad and the Odyssey would have been oral stories, oral traditions that were told over time and were very popular. Um, and then eventually they were written down and uh, attributed to Homer. So, uh, you know, what we do know is that uh, there were probably ballads uh, that were, were sung and were repeated and told by the sages and the philosophers and the kind of the, the rock stars, if you will, of the day who uh, had plenty of time on their hands to sit around and uh, tell these stories and wander from town to town and, and repeat these epic tales of the, uh, the hero's quest, trying to make it home, trying to, you know, get back to uh, one's family after the war, and, and uh, really fascinating uh, kind of to think of how these poems uh, originated with the poets. Uh, for many centuries, the poor blind singer uh, would beg their way through ancient Greece and they would be the ones who would sit around and profess and proclaim uh, what this, these poems, these epic poems like the Iliad and the Odyssey. So the idea of epic poetry, as the Greeks understood it, is most clearly expressed uh, by Aristotle, which we, we will discuss a lot. Um, we'll touch the ideas of Aristotle. He was probably the most uh, powerfully uh, contributing philosopher of Greek-speaking um, language. He was pretty much had his hand in all areas of thought, uh, from religion to uh, ethics and many, many, many scores of volumes that we attribute to Aristotle. Um, but epic poetry can be defined by its difference from lyric and dramatic uh, poetry. It was distinguished from lyric as poetry which was recited, not sung to music. Um, we would distinguish Homer's epic, hope, you know, his, his heroic epic poetry, um, we would call it different than, say, dramatic, which was poetry that was narrated and imitated, um, acted out, so, so to speak. And so in an epic poem, Aristotle gives us a, a very uh, succinct distinction by saying that the epic poem will have a dignified theme, it will have organic unity and ordered progress, um, the events must be connected in like a series and must all kind of conduce in the end, come to an end, find a conclusion. And so epic poetry follows this very structure, um, has a beginning, has a middle, has an end. Uh, Aristotle 
To Aristotle, Homer is at once the earliest of poets and the most finished of epic artists. A uh, cool fact about the Iliad is it's actually the second most plentiful collection of Greek manuscripts that exist. And uh, they come in second to the New Testament manuscripts. So there are about 700 published uh, papyri manuscripts. The earliest copy of Homer's Iliad we possess uh, dates approximately 900 years after the original. And the reason I point that out is because we have New Testament manuscripts, um, you know, from the Gospels, fragments of the Gospels, and some of the letters of Paul uh, that date within very, uh, within some, depending on the scholar, I mean, some would date it more conservatively, some may date it more liberally, uh, but maybe within a hundred years, uh, just to kind of be in the middle there. Some would even contend within 50 years of the authorship, uh, meaning the, the moment someone sat down to write it and someone copied it and the manuscript passed along, we have some that may have existed 50 years after the autograph date. Um, now, uh, just so you know, there are no original manuscripts of um, Homer's Iliad or even the New Testament. Um, all of the manuscripts we have, they, they date from a later period from the day that they wrote them down. And some people may say, well, um, you know, they must have just made it up. Well, for one, you know, um, the, the material that they wrote in the New Testament, or in any case of any Greek manuscript, uh, you know, the information that's written down is written on a, a material that is not very well preserved, and so the way that it was preserved uh, was it was copied and written down. And some people may say, well, surely there must be some sort of discrepancy, right, between these manuscript copies, and who could possibly uh, trust that the, the authorship of the copies is reliable? Well, there's, that's a great question to ask, uh, but we have scholars who actually do test the reliability and authenticity of a manuscript and hold it to scrutiny, and they say that it is within, you know, the 99% range of accuracy from manuscript to manuscript, which tells us they took a painstakingly careful approach to preserving these ancient texts. Um, but the same thing would, would hold true for the manuscripts that we hold for uh, the Iliad. But the Iliad comes in second to the manuscripts that are in possession today by scholars and museums um, of, on the New Testament. But to get back to the, uh, the Iliad, uh, it derives its unity not simply from the person of the central hero, but really it's all about his wrath. And so uh, this word wrath in the Greek is, is manin or manus, which we call, we would say anger or wrath. And so the, uh, the central theme of the, uh, let me wipe that off, central theme of the Iliad is wrath. And so central, which is what we call, we'll write it like that for you, manus. So the central theme for the Iliad is wrath, anger. Um, uh, so you know, the, the opening lines actually give us uh, an indication as such. Um, the, the major theme that um, Achilles is, is dealing with is his wrath, his anger, or wrath in general. And so whenever the, the actual opening lines of the, uh, of the poem, we, we have uh, the English translation here, wrath, Goddess, seeing the wrath of Peleus' son Achilles, and so even in the very opening lines, you have this uh, this this wrath, this anger, um, beginning to to unravel, and kind of that's the theme. If you were to try to nail down a a main theme in the Iliad, it would be wrath, anger. 
So the story of the Iliad falls naturally into three chapters. And that's the ordered progress that Aristotle spoke of that is necessary for uh, what we would call the epic poem. Um, so in books one through nine, Achilles is affronted by Agamemnon and withdraws in sullen anger from the war. The Greeks are discomfited and finally, uh, you know, Achilles, he's upset, you know, and, and so he's trying to be stirred to do something. And so in, in books 10 through 18, um, let's see, after much fighting and varied fortune, the Greeks are again reduced to extremities. Patroclus takes the field in the armor of Achilles, and after driving the Trojans from the ships, he is slain. Achilles is stricken with grief at the prayer of his mother Thasis, the god of fire, Hephaestus fashions new armor for um, for Achilles. Um, then in uh, the the next chunk, we have the the books of uh, twenty, you know, nineteen through twenty four. Um, Achilles renounces his wrath, returns to the warfare, slays Hector, um, then Priam, led by the god Hermes, ransoms the corpse of his son by the victor and takes it back to be mourned and buried at Troy. Um, so the Odyssey is an epic account of survival and homecoming. Uh, the poem tells of the return, or in Greek, nostos, of Odysseus from the Greek victory at Troy to Ithaca, the small rocky island from which he set out 20 years before. Um, so the, the, the Odyssey is, is different in many regards, and uh, one thing that I was going to have you do after you have watched this lecture, you know, read the article. Uh, that addresses the film, O oh Brother, Where Art Thou?, um, which is really just a, a modern take on the story of the Odyssey, but set in, uh, you know, the southern United States, you know, during the time of uh, slavery, and um, just a really fascinating uh, take. And I guess to kind of speak back to what I addressed in the first lecture about uh, myths and uh, archetypes, uh, you can tell a story many, many times in many different ways. It's the same story, even though the, the setting may change, the characters may seem to change, the time period could change, but there's something that in those stories we find very authentic to the human experience. And that's why a movie like Oh Brother, Where Art Thou would be so successful when really all it's doing is retelling a tale that's thousands of years old that has been passed down, you know, was once an oral tale that was then written down and then handed down and preserved. Even, uh, you know, these manuscripts that we attribute to Homer are some of the, you know, very well-preserved manuscripts we have on hand. So uh, something about the authentic experiences of Odysseus and the story, you know, it's uh, something that speaks to the, the human experience. And so that's why you're doing the exercise with the film. And I uh, hope you may have seen it before, but after reading the article, uh, you will see there's a very specific, um, you know, characters in the story that are types, you know, archetypes or symbolically they are the same that you find in the story of Odysseus. But uh, it's all about the homecoming. And so as you had, will see in the film, or you've probably already seen the film, um, you know, they're, they're trying to get back home, right? And so that, that theme of the homecoming, the, the journey to get back home, to be with one's family, is a very archetypal kind of uh, authentic element in, you know, anthropology, and what it means to be a human being. And so uh, the central theme of the uh, Trojan legend 
that getting back home, getting home again, was at least as great a challenge for the Greeks as it was to win the war. Because when they went off to fight the war, they, they went long and they went far. And then when the war is over, there was just as much of trial and hardship to get back home. Um, you know, many heroes lost their homecomings. They died at Troy, uh, including uh, Achilles, the greatest warrior of the Greeks, whose decision to fight in the full knowledge that he would not survive to go home again is told in the Iliad. Um, but the Odyssey contains accounts of the homecomings of all the major heroes who went to Troy. But it gives that story a distinctive emphasis through its focus on Odysseus, who is presented as the hero best suited to the arduous task of homecoming, and the one whose return is both the most difficult and protracted and the most joyful and glorious. It's all about the homecoming. So if you were to highlight a theme right in the Iliad, what is it going to be? It's going to be anger, wrath. Um, if you highlight a theme in the uh, Odyssey, It's going to be homecoming. So uh, just to just to kind of wrap it up on the on the Odyssey, um, the the opening lines of the Odyssey is to alert the reader to Odysseus's cleverness and his endurance, his solicitude for his crewmates and. Um, whose folly prevented their returns from Troy to Ithaca, their island home. And, and so in the very first line it says, Muse, tell me of the man of many turns, who, after sacking the sacred citadel of Troy, was driven far off course. And so we kind of set this, the tone of this uh, heroic poem that, that's going to speak of Odysseus's homecoming. Um, of course, we can't talk about the uh, the Greeks without talking about the um, the gods um, and what I mean by that is to the Greeks there there was no separation of of life from the activity of the gods the the gods were attributed with having a hand in everything you know you stump your toe and you're like why Zeus you know have you done this to me what did I do you have a good day, and you say, well, the gods are, are thinking favorably of me. And, and so there, there was really no aspect of life that was devoid of the influence of the gods. But there were 12 major gods who were believed to actually physically live on Mount Olympus. Um, you know, and just to give you a side note, um, the Olympics, right, the reason we call them the Olympics is based on the Olympus, the Mount of Olympus, where the Greek gods live. So the Olympics were actually done in an effort to please the gods. And so um, next time you're watching the Olympics, you can pull that fact out and tell your friends and say, you know, this is uh, all because it was developed as a way of showing devotion and loyalty and respect and honor to the gods. Um, now we do the same thing, but the God is consumerism, and it's all about the commercials. I'm kidding, but, uh, you know, it's interesting to see where we are today, yet to look at where we had begun. But the 12 major gods are um, Zeus, right? Uh, so we've got Zeus, which is the king of the gods. He's basically A1, number one, god of gods, uh, king of gods. And then you've got Hera, which is his wife but also his sister. And so, you know, incest and promiscuity is apparently not a, uh, anything, there's nothing wrong with that in, in the Greek theology of the gods. Uh, then you have Athena, who is the goddess of war, but also known for wisdom and peace. You've got Ares, which is the god of war. Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty. Apollo, the god of sun. Light, truth, prophecy, music, and medicine. Artemis, who is the goddess of the hunt and the moon. Demeter, which is the goddess of agriculture and grain. Dionysus is the god of wine and inspiration. Hermes, the messenger of the gods. Hades, the god of the underworld. 
Uh, we actually translate the word Hades, which is also a place, the underworld, um, particularly in the New Testament. Hades is one of the words translated into hell. Um, so the god of the underworld is Hades. Hephaestus is the god of the forge and fire. Hestia is the goddess of the hearth, the fireside, balm, domesticity. Poseidon, the god of the sea, and Persephone is the goddess of fertility. So uh, the temples and sanctuaries in ancient Greek culture abound because belief in the gods abounds. And so you have this uh, manifestation of, of architectural structures, you know, one of the greatest structures of which would be the Pantheon, right? The, this giant place to honor the gods and temples and places where sacrifices were performed and all other sorts of um, maybe even um, corruptible things that would take place as well. Um, anyhow, we won't go into depth on what those corruptible things may have been, but let's just say sexual purity was not uh, an aspect of worshiping gods who sexual purity was not an issue for them, if you follow me. So orgies and things of that nature were also carried out in uh, the worship of the gods. So uh, one really fascinating um, is the sanctuary uh, of Apollo in Delphi is really very fascinating. And, and if you've ever you know been exposed to um, any of the of the Greek in, of the New Testament, where they're in the Greek speaking world, specifically in Acts sixteen, um, Paul going to uh, Athens in Acts seventeen, but in Acts sixteen. They are in Thyatira, and uh, they come in contact with a slave girl who is possessed by a, a demon, as it were, in the, in the story. And Paul casts this devil out. Um, and the, the word for the spirit, the name of the spirit, was Pythos. And so we actually have a historical setting for this oracle in Delphi, um, the sanctuary of Apollo was this place where uh, the, the prophetess would go in the, the lower parts of the temple where they had now discovered archaeologically that there may have been leaking gas, methane gas or some other sort of hallucinogenic gas that would intoxicate the prophetess. So the prophetess would, you know, as an oracle, a prophet, she would hang out in the, the, the presence of these gases, she would get high and then she would prophesy or she would speak um, and so these um, that's what essentially the Apostle Paul is encountering in Acts 16 and uh, the slave girl has literally a spirit of Pythoness and the reason it's the, the Python connection there you might be thinking what is that all about well um, the place of the actual uh, Apollo Sanctuary, the sanctuary of Apollo in Delphi, he was attributed to. It was attributed to Apollo because, as the legend, the tradition goes, Apollo came in and he took out the the Python god, and so it, it was like an overthrowing. But the Python still had some sort of part in the in the the myth, um, and so the the slave girl she has the spirit of Python. And the same sort of spirit stood behind the most famous of Greek oracles, the Delphi Oracle of Apollo, whose priestess was called a Pythoness, named after the Pythian Apollo, slayer of the great Python. Um, well, just a little bit here about the polis, um, the polis, which is actually the word for city. So if you were to say metropolis, you know, polis refers to city. Um, if I remember correctly, my Greek, that would be polis as such. Um, same thing with, uh, you know, the uh, necropolis would be the city of the dead. Decopolis would be deca for ten in Greek. This would be ten cities, the place of ten cities. Um, anyway, so just to give you a little bit of idea, but in a political sort of sociological idea, the Greek polis was by definition sovereign. It was an independent, autonomous state run by citizens, free of any outside power 
or restraint. Uh, the polis emerged after the fall of the Mycenaean civilization. And um, at that point, I'm going to stop the video because um, I have to do this in chunks so that I can record on my camera. So I'm going to stop there, but I'm going to start again in just a moment.